All right, our next presentation is from uh, Bob Satorius from Central Indiana. Um, I think he has a, a very exciting slide deck to go through. And Bob, if we can try to kind of limit around 30 minutes, that would be great. We're a little over, that's okay, but let's uh, see where we can go. Okay. Thank I'll, you. I'll start my timer now and um, <laughs> cut myself off. So um, basically, I do have a, a PowerPoint to um, share with. Uh, and this will be available as a PDF. Um, John has I've already sent it to John, so he'll get it to you. I also have an, a full equipment list, a spreadsheet with uh, links to where we got most of the items and the costs, at least from uh, back in 2018 when we put it together. So anyhow, I am uh, with the Central Indiana Woodworkers. Um, my role now is VP of Marketing. That grew as a result of initially volunteering to help put together this video system that you're gonna hear about. It's definitely a high-end system, and um, yet it meets our needs quite extensively. I'm going to talk about who we are as an organization, uh, the requirements that went into the design. Uh, we'll look at the components in the system and how we have it set up for uh, live live streaming and hybrid meetings, and uh, just share some ideas of what we learned from, from the whole process, uh, answering questions as time allows. And then um, if needed and you have additional questions, there are some parts we can go deeper on. So. Anyhow, jumping right into it, um, we are, uh, as of this morning, uh, two, 352 members in our club. Uh, we serve about nine different, members come from about nine different counties around Indianapolis. Um, in 2020, we actually uh, had a, the Central Indiana chapter of AAW merge with us, so they're now under our umbrella. We also added in 2021, the Circle City Carvers. Um, the main, all of us meet together at least monthly uh, for a group meeting and we have a guest presenter. Um, we also have throughout the year, um, uh, each month we have what we call special interest chapters that meet monthly as well. Uh, turning again, that's the AAW chapter. We have a carving chapter, uh, scroll saw, uh, one group concentrating on uh, furniture making and the newest one is digital woodworking covering CNC and uh, laser uh, shaper origin and all those kinds of things. Um, and we also have throughout the region different workshops where people open those up for um, our club. We're well known in the community for our charitable activities. Through the course of the year, we make over 10,000 toys that are given away at the, during the holidays. So um, our members join together in these regional workshops to work on that and other projects. The venue where we meet is at, at a Carpenters Union Hall. It seats about 200 people with tables. Um, it has in the back left, you'll see a kitchen area for snacks and meals and the, the, the open door in the back is a storage closet. Um, I really appreciate that they have and let us use freely the, their gigabit fiber internet service. Um, the storage room is only about 100 square feet, but it gives us room to store pretty much everything. You see we have a robust uh, Sweet 16 lathe back there. There's a, um, a grinder for uh, sharpening tools, uh, depending on what's going on, you'll find a bandsaw back there at times or scroll saw. So um, we, it's obviously the most logical place for us to store our equipment as well. When, when I first started attending back in 2017, the old system that we had in place for video was a, uh, a projector hung from the ceiling, a single camcorder, and just some simple desk lights that would um, help show at least what was going on up in the front. You couldn't see it real well, especially in the summertime when the uh, bright sunlight was streaming through the windows, the screen was very washed out. So um, the board Did others lose audio? I think he's here. He's back now. Can you hear me still? Now I can. Okay. Um, basically, the the number one requirement was for us to basically improve the overall experience for the meetings in the hall, and to make sure we had a system that would work for recording things in remote workshops. And eventually, they would like to be able to do um, live streams. That was back in 2018, before COVID shut everything down. Another requirement was that it needed to be portable meaning we had to put everything away in the closet at the end of meetings. And yet we also had to be able to transport it to other remote locations for the workshop sessions. And of course, uh, because it's equipment, we need to be able to have uh, cases that would treat it gently. So 
It also had to be volunteer friendly. Uh, FAP is what they told me. It has to be as foolproof as possible for our volunteers. And so we agreed we would color code and label everything. And then I included uh, set up diagrams and manuals for our volunteers to use in, in getting it all set up. Um, the goal for cameras was to get better coverage of what was going on in the front of the room. More cameras with higher quality cameras to use for that. Uh, they also decided rather than rely on the projector that they wanted uh, monitors in the halls. So those need to be on wheels and uh, spaced accordingly. We also had to be able to connect everything to the in-house audio system at the hall. They had speakers mounted in the ceiling and their own mixer and amplifier. So that was a requirement. Uh, we built a budget for the project in phases. I proposed three, the production equipment, then the post-production so, so we could do recording and editing. And then the last component would have been the live streaming. They approved the first two phases right away in 2018. And so we went ahead and spent the money. Um, I'm going to go through the actual components in that system, but, but I, again, want to say we've got a power or a PDF file of all this later. Um, to start out with, we were asking, you know, what kind of questions, uh, what kind of cameras should we use? And as you know, there are different uh, connection types to choose from, um, with benefits and uh, you know bad sides to each one of them. So we chose the two in the middle, HDMI and SDI connections and go deeper into that later. But these are the cameras we landed on. They're called PTZ cameras. PTZ stands for pan, tilt, and zoom. Um, as you can see on the right, they use a um, SDI cable with a BNC connector, as well as having an ethernet connection that provides both power and control for the pan, tilt, zoom functions. We have two of those, you'll notice they're color-coded. Um, cables we made up specifically for where each camera would be located in the hall. Cables included the, uh, the SDI video cable and the ethernet cable. They were uh, tied together so that um, they were spooled and used as one. To control it, we uh, landed on using a joystick uh, operation. Uh, you see this panel here, it, it actually works for controlling four different cameras and it's all connected using your uh, ethernet or your network. Uh, configuration um, to, to kind of give us a, an extra leg up on how we use the cameras. We, we went ahead and purchased a boom arm and that is about a six foot long uh, extension uh, mounted on a sturdy tripod. And um, we basically placed that so that the camera is overhead. Uh, before each meeting, we decide where we think that camera needs to be depending on the content for the demonstration. And then we, we place it and that cameras in kind of a fixed or static location. And yet using the, the joystick controller, it can be panned and tilted and zoomed all around for close-ups, uh, overhead shots of let's say a lathe or um, some other tool. And we do have a, a show and tell segment. And so this is really nice to have to be able to get close-ups of, of uh, projects as they are shown. Um, the second type of camera we chose was called an EPTZ, E meaning electronic pan, tilt, and zoom. Uh, you'll notice on the right, it has two outputs, uh, video outputs, SDI outputs. What that does is it gives us on the left one static wide shot, but then the other channel can be zoomed in electronically so that you can get a, a secondary shot from within a subshot of the, the hole. And uh, that gives us, again, one more option to have on our uh, switcher to choose from during production. So we mostly have a wide shot and then a, a podium shot that we use uh, during our meetings. Uh, we also had, a, again, the original Handycam that uh, we still use on occasion. Um, we like it because it has the, um, uh, oh, the, the LCD screen that the operator can use to see and zoom in and move around on stage. We don't care as much for the GoPro after we've started using it because once you've got it uh, connected to a live feed, you lose the screen to be able to uh, focus or aim it. And so it's not as user friendly. The other issue we've had with GoPro is that it's not as stable uh, on the HDMI signal to our ATEM. And um, as a result, we, we ended up uh, using it on as needed for close-ups, let's say at a lathe or whatever. But in order for it to be a stable camera, we had to invest in a, a, uh, an image scaler. Uh, this is called a decimator. It's an extremely good and powerful uh, little tool to have in, in our grip bag. 
but it also comes in handy when a guest presenter brings in a laptop that won't seem to connect well to uh, to the ATEM by running it through this device, whether it's, uh, it's mostly through the HDMI in and outs, um, it does give you a stable signal. We've, we've tried the bit with a uh, HDMI splitter and uh, we're not real happy with the results of that. So uh, this has been a, a really good uh, solution. I can go into more detail on that later. The heart of the system is uh, the uh, ATEM Production Studio HD. And we chose this one because it had four HDMI inputs as well as four SDI inputs. Of course, it has the two uh, balanced audio inputs as well with the XLR connectors there. It has uh, the overkill in terms of output it has eight SDIs, but um, of course it does have the um, HDMI multi-view output. Um, we use it with, a, well, backing up real quick, the, the front panel that has buttons that you can switch directly from that that panel, although we don't use that as frequently as using the software solution. Uh, we have just to the to the left of, of the main unit, we have a touchscreen monitor set up and a wireless keyboard. And that's what we use primarily during uh, meetings so that we can do the switching and we can cut to the audio panel to um, set audio levels for within the system. Of course, anyone has an ATEM knows of the multi-view, how it breaks up your uh, inputs into and in, in your uh, shot selection into the preview and program modes up at the top and then has your eight input sources down below. For recording, we uh, went again with another Blackmagic product. It's uh, designed to pair with the ATEM um, HD Studio. It's the HyperDeck Studio Mini. Uh, it records two uh, SDXC cards. And I'm thinking uh, 128 gigs gives us about 100 and well, no, I'm sorry. one hour and 14 minutes, I think, is the, the length of time for each of those. And it seamlessly switches between the two during um, during gathering. So that's it's very nice to record everything nonstop. Um, OK, the again, the way we've got it configured is we've got the two side by side, the, the uh, ATEM and the HyperDeck uh, are, have their own rack mount one unit high. Just below that is a power strip, and below that is a drawer. Um, our system is a two-person uh, two operation. Uh, first person operates uh, the cameras using the joystick there, and, and he actually can use those front panel buttons to do the switching if, if needed. Uh, but that's he's uh, all of our team are volunteers, so there's Rick. He's 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 an amazing guy, guy behind the joystick there. So um, the second person, uh, in this is where I usually sit. Uh, kind of has a blanks of computers to sit behind. One on the very far left is our computer dedicated to the live stream uh, and it has OBS and we monitor our website as well on that one. Um, you'll see the audio cart that we built to go with the system there beside it. And then at the top of that cart is where our live stream encoder sits in its own little uh, box. Um, You'll see on the very far right is the ATEM touch screen. And then we have another computer dedicated to run the PowerPoint presentations in the Zoom uh, feed from any uh, presentations that might be coming in. And again, that's the front. You'll see where our internet connection is. It's, it's actually on the backside of a podium in the hall. And uh, it, it's a very, uh, very solid um, internet connection for us to do everything we do. The actual system, again, it, it's built in a um, road case. Uh, and I can talk about that if time allows. Uh, Multi-view monitor sits on top, joystick in front of it, and then the, the touch screen monitor to the side of it. Um, the way it's worked is uh, on the far left, there's a drawer, a door that opens where we store the joystick and all the cabling. The right has a computer interface for the, basically the, it has two USBs, an HDMI and an audio. And then a drawer below where we store the, uh, the touch screen monitor and keyboard and uh, just other issues, uh, other items like that. So on the back side of the unit at the very top is what's called a keystone panel. And it's a, a very customizable way to uh, build yourself a, a patch panel that will work well for your, uh, your needs. And I can go into that as well deeper if, if uh, there's questions about it. Uh, to either side of that are cooling fans, and in the very center is a controller for the fans. Um, with the equipment in there and power supply, it does get 
fairly warm. There's a thermometer inside that tracks that and will adjust the fan speed up or down to keep it uh, at a constant temperature. We've never had any overheating as a result of incorporating that. There's an audio input to the right. And um, down below, we have a spot, our uh, multi-view monitor slides right in there and is cradled in the actual original packaging for the, for the monitor that's underneath it there. Uh, inside the unit is on the on the right, you see the, the little computer. It's only about a six inch by six inch uh, square little box. It is a Intel NUC i5 running, running Windows 10. Uh, the other components in there, there is a network router that gives us Wi-Fi capabilities, but the PoE is the, uh, the, the PoE stands for power over ethernet. And that's what provides the uh, electricity we need to power our cameras. And uh, the same cables also give us the control. Uh, this shows what it looks like with everything connected at the back. Uh, again, we did color code and labeled everything. Uh, you'll notice we use a lot of rip ties. Uh, that's one way we have found it's extremely good to be able to um, coil everything up safely. And, and so when we throw that in our road boxes, they don't get uh, tangled or uh, distorted in the boxes. And of course, we tape and cover uh, everything that goes on the floor. The audio system, again, um, is designed to be opened up and then closed up at the end of the meetings. It incorporates a, a Behringer 12 by four uh, audio mixer. We have four Shure uh, mic receivers and their antennas are immediately below that. Uh, we incorporated a digital delay into our system and I can talk deeper on that if necessary, if there's questions on it. There is a power strip for that unit. So one switch turns everything on and then down below are two different drawers. The top one is for microphones and the bottom is for cables and other accessories. Setting this up is very simple, it's four steps. First, you just open up the back. Second, you move that mixer from the shelf to the top and you'll notice all the cables are already uh, bundled and pre-connected. And all we have to do then is uncoil the two XLR cables you see sitting on top of the mixer on the right. And those plug into our main video system and power it up and it's ready to go. Everything is already pre-wired to the house uh, mixer and amplifier. And so uh, makes it very simple. We've, we've already color coded every, all the mics and the connections. Um, our digital delay is uh, set up to be part of the effect send features of that particular board. And it returns back to our system and then is passed, uh, the delayed audio is passed along to the um, recording and our live stream. Um, so it's already, uh, uh, fixed audio by the time it gets to the uh, to the viewers. Um, we also have additional cables that are ready for um, additional inputs and outputs, like if we were doing a Zoom meeting, whatever. We do have uh, four different mics. Two of them are the uh, Shure SM58s with uh, wireless uh, uh, um, transmitters, and then two SM35 headset mics with belt pack transmitters. And um, those work extremely well um, over the distances of that big of a hall. Um, monitors, we, we actually found four matching 65-inch <laughs> uh, LCD monitors at uh, Walmart on clearance when we were looking. And so we snatched those up pretty quick. And then we found on uh, Amazon the, the rolling carts. They're very sturdy, very solid, and uh, make it very easy to move uh, monitors into position. We do have on the back of each monitor a diagram on uh, to show where they go in the hall. Cables are pre-cut and uh, configured for wherever their positions are and they're color coded as well. Um, to, to feed the signal for those, we invested in, it's an HDMI ethernet converter. Um, you'll see it in use there color coded on the left, but it has one main unit and then four individual units that go on the monitors. The way it works is that the uh, HDMI signal comes out of the main uh, video system into the converter. Then using ethernet cables, it can go up to 130 foot each of those uh, cables to the box mounted on the back of the TV, which then converts the signal from the ethernet cable to an HDMI signal and then plugs in using a small jumper to the back of the monitors. And knock wood, <laughs> we've never had any problems with this system 
uh, no loss of sync or uh, signal um, during uh, meetings or any other time. We also have one monitor that's on the front table immediately in front of where the presenter is, and that gives them a sense of what the audience is seeing from the monitors and helps when they're trying to position for a close up of something perhaps that they are working on. We do have a clock there. Unfortunately, our presenters don't seem to want to pay attention to <laughs> time on that, and I am watching my time here. So, um, lighting is a um, another issue that we needed to deal with as well. The table lamps that we had were just very insufficient, so we invested in a, a three light kit with what are called soft boxes. Each of the lights has five CFL bulbs. Uh, they are daylight balanced which makes them extremely good for doing color balance with our cameras, uh, for doing a white balance that's very stable. Uh, each lamp has its own uh, reflector housing and then a, a diffusion screen over the top of it. And um, they give a good flat um, but bright uh, light on the stage. We've never had anyone complain about the, uh, the intensity of those lights being too much for a presenter. So, uh, it gives us a good balance of what we feel is necessary to get good video on the stage. While we're doing all of the setup, we decided to go ahead and work on some branding that would be a part of the upgrade. We've got a backdrop and a new podium and, uh, of course, put information on our um, cases. But we also did a, a website upgrade as well that um, has now been used quite extensively for our virtual meetings as well. This is a, a diagram of what our system is like, and this will be, I'll include this as well as a separate uh, handout for y'all to, to see and um, get ideas from. But um, it kind of shows how we've configured everything to work together. Um, let me think here, next. What's the advantage of the SDI? SDI is much higher video quality. We don't ever have any problems with video dropout like we do with HDMI. Is it the it, same as cable? Uh, not necessarily cable. It's uh, it's just I, well, I guess it is the same configuration on uh, on the cable itself, uh, but a serial digital interface, which uh, encodes it in a little bit different way than a traditional HDMI signal signal would, and I think makes it much more uh, stable overall. So and and it gives you. We found that the, the quality of the cameras tends to be a little bit higher when it has the SDI um, options for it. So. It, the replacement for the A10 that we have is um, now all exclusively SDI cables. The, the ones that um, like the, the A10 Mini and the Mini Pro and those still have HDMI connectors. Um, but uh, again, for our purposes, we felt the upgrade to the SDI cameras was, was worth the investment. So. What resolution are you running your whole system at? Uh, 1080, 1080p. Uh, 30 frames per second and that is we thought about 4k but we felt that was overkill uh, both in terms of what what it would need to i mean the cost for the cameras as well as the, uh, the again this is an hd system the atem hd uh, they do have a the newer version is 4k and bob, are you at the end of your presentation i'm getting close can we just let bob get through it then is that okay keep going please go okay. ahead Okay, so um, basically our live setups are like you've seen there. We uh, we basically have done this for online and archive purposes. We recorded things. Of course, during pre-COVID, we were having you know 120 people per meeting. COVID changed all that, and um, not long after, uh, we realized that the state was going to limit us to only 15 people in the hall. The board did approve going ahead and getting what we needed to do live stream, and that was basically adding another black tent, uh, black magic uh, item. It's the web presenter. It's basically an encoder, takes our uh, 1080 signal and uh, converts it down to a, a 720 encoder, sends it through an, uh, a USB cable to our laptop. But we like this unit because it actually has two video inputs that are switchable. Uh, one SDI and one HDMI. And so we can connect a camera and a laptop or two cameras. And this unit makes it very easy for us to do remote presentations from any one of our uh, member workshops that uh, where we might have a, one of our chapter meetings. It's connected, again, we create a little box for it to sit in so that the presenter can 
it's angled up to them. They can reach down very easily and switch between whatever two sources. Uh, that can be sent to a uh, computer. We use Open Broadcast to uh, record those presentations or to forward it along to Zoom or whatever. Uh, we did create on our website a virtual uh, meeting page. Uh, basically took the viewer, uh, the player, and embedded it into our website. Uh, we, we use Club Express, so uh, we were able to build all this within Club Express quite easily. We also added a chat module you'll see there for, uh, to provide members a way to uh, talk back to us during the presentation. Um, the remote setups, as I mentioned, give us the ability to do a, the two camera setups, and all we need for those is a, basically a monitor, a laptop, and that device to, to be able to, we don't really even need the laptop unless we're doing a Zoom meeting or if we want to record it, but it does give us the ability to see and members can see what's going on in close up from, uh, from those kind of setups. We did our first virtual meeting then in May of 2020 with Alex Snodgrass. He had been signed up to come and uh, present for us and then COVID changed that. So he ended up doing a presentation right from his shop and he sent his feed via Zoom. We added it into our system as if it were just a normal uh, camera feed and um, basically took his audio through our soundboard and added that separately to the feed. And that worked pretty good. We were, we were overall happy, but the one thing at the end of it was we realized that there was no way for him to see our audience. So we kind of went back to drawing board and, and decided to incorporate an iPad into that layout. Um, an iPad gives you the ability to have the Zoom app on it and that, that can become one more participant in your Zoom call. And we just turned the iPad around and aimed it at the audience uh, so, and put the microphone stand in front of it so that anyone who had a question for a presenter could stand up and um, do their talk. And by adding that, it made a huge difference in our overall Zoom setup for uh, giving us a real back and forth interaction between uh, our members and presenters. So. Um, then we've started doing more and more hybrid meetings. Actually, this is uh, Dennis Belcher, who recently joined us as one of our, um, this was, I think, the turning group that met uh, not too long ago. And um, basically, it was a Zoom meeting. Uh, we had a webcam at the top. We had a microphone in the audience for people to speak back to him. And um, for the most part, it worked pretty good. We, we actually recorded it. And Dennis is actually, or he recorded it, and it's online now uh, for a certain amount of time that he's been able to share with us. So lessons learned after all, all said and done. Now we've been running the system about four years now. Um, it has given us a much better viewing experience in the hall. Um, it's helped increase our membership dramatically. And so we, we feel like we should have made a change earlier. Um, it allowed us though to keep having meetings all through the pandemic, despite lockdowns. We missed only one month in our uh, meeting plans during the COVID shutdown. So that, uh, that was good. Um, we have realized though, not all members are comfortable with technology and even getting them to log in online to, to attend uh, meeting, meetings on our virtual meeting portal is, is a challenge for some. However, having a lot of our videos available on YouTube, uh, archived there for members only, um, it is, it's served to be really a uh, powerful benefit to members uh, to, to, to stay involved in our club. Um, we're realizing that hybrid meetings allow us to have more presenters per year um, they, and our costs are lower accordingly. We also know that through our meetings that presenters want to see and hear their audiences more. So um, that's, that's a lesson learned. Overall, I think it's been definitely worth the investment for us to be a part of that. So um, I'll, I'm at, it looks like 28 minutes. So I'll, uh, I'll stop and ask if there's any questions and if there's additional uh, questions about any of these other issues that I can go deeper, but I, I'm not the keeper of the time to, to say how much I can do with that. So question? Uh, uh, Bob, we can safely say that's a wow. Um, I, I had one question and I, and I saw several others come up with the same question. Since you have to store everything in the closet, and I assume your monitors go in the closet too. How long does it take you to set this all up before a meeting? Um, if if I'm working by myself, I can do it in about an hour and about hour and a half 
to set it up. And we're usually have everything put away within 45 minutes of, of uh, end of the meeting. Is there anyone else in the group can do it besides you? Yes. Um, and I have uh, my my job takes me on the road uh, two or three times a year during meetings. And so our team has been able to carry on without me. That's great. Rick, I think I see you as the next one in line. How much did it cost? <laughs> um, all total, we budgeted 20000 and wow. um, and that was all th for all three phases. So we spent initially about sixteen, no, about seventeen, I guess, for initial, and we've since added some upgrades uh, to that as well as like the uh, live stream functionality that has come later. Okay. Let's see, Gretchen. I saw on one of your slides that you listed OBS Studio as a, a package that you're using. Have you had any difficulty getting that to work with Zoom? Because I have not been able to get it to work with Zoom. No, none at all. And I what think operating part, system are you using? I'm sorry, say that again. What operating system are you using? Well, it's a PC. That that computer is running PC. Windows. Um, I think I heard Windows yes. 10. Yes. Yeah, Windows. Well, that's for the the video system. The, um, the streaming computer is a Windows system. Our PowerPoint and Zoom computer is a Mac. Okay. And, but the Mac is feeding as a, you know, a participant or a video source into our overall system. The PC is used simply to then stream it to either our, uh, our streaming service, Daycast, or we can loop that back to Zoom if, if we're not using the Zoom meeting portal itself. I'll have to give that a try. I've been using everything in Linux and uh, Zoom and OBS do not seem to be uh, play well in Linux. Hmm. Okay. Randy? Uh, yes. Uh, Bob, I want you to know that the church I attend has an audiovisual system to do streaming of services and it mirrors almost exactly yours. <laughs> it is almost identical. The difference is only that we have three PTZ cameras, um, and uh, but we use uh, we use SDI, we use uh, Ethernet uh, converters to reach our projectors, which are up in the front of the church, and other than that, it's virtually identical. Yeah, so, this is a common configuration for uh, churches and. Uh, Convention halls actually are using this more and more too. Yep. Is that it, Randy? You have any other comments? Yep, that was it. Uh, Joe Lares. Oh, hi. Hey, excellent, Bob. Really impressed. Um, in the four years mm -hmm. since you initially got this rolling, what has changed, um, and what what would uh, you say? Uh, you wish you had waited if, if that is uh, the case for some of the um, technology or whatever. Yeah, I was ready to go ahead and start doing the live streaming right away. Uh, again, the board in terms of uh, financial commitment said we'll hold off till we feel it's necessary. Well, COVID, you know, pretty much lit the fire under them to say do it now. Um, and I'm glad they did because it then facilitated us having um, our, and I've, I've actually come to really push Zoom. I, I had been using Zoom well before the pandemic and felt it was a good interactive way to hold meetings. And so I'm, I'm glad that the club has acknowledged that that is a, a really powerful tool, um, especially for demonstrations when uh, you, if, especially if your presenter can have a multi-camera setup. Um, I think that works really good. And I'll uh, hats off to Dennis Belcher, his presentation that he did uh, via Zoom uh, he has his own, I don't know if it's an A10 Mini or what, but he had a multi-camera setup and um, was it vMix? I, I can't remember. It was vMix, yes. VMix. Okay. So but I, I would not I would not do that again. <laughs> okay. Um, I think for presenters to have a multi-camera option to, to provide the best possible image quality for their members, I think really enhances the whole uh, experience. Um, I appreciated your learning about using the iPad to get that two-way experience. And I learned the same thing from John Kelsey, actually. And we use a, an iPhone um, that works really well for that. 
and it, it changes the entire meeting when all of a sudden there's a, a view back by the presenter to see the meeting folks that are there and interact directly. I think it changes the experience dramatically. Yeah. One, one thing I will say, we did have issues in early on with um, audio feedback during Zoom meetings. And we, we had to play with our, the way we configured audio. Uh, I think we, we did it like four different ways before we landed on what seems to work best. And one of our recommendations is for the presenter to actually wear earbuds so that there's no risk of uh, feedback within their uh, system. And the reason I say that is a lot of times a presenter will have not just their one primary video or Zoom feed, but sometimes they'll have a second one up to monitor. And what happens is one or the other might have an open mic and cause that feedback loop. So um, that was- We've all experienced that three to five yeah. minutes of pain when that happens. Uh. <laughs> yeah. I've also experimented the same as you have, Bob, with uh, iPads set up on a mask that people can walk up to and just talk into, and suddenly they're there in the Zoom. And yeah. I found uh, set, not everyone takes to it, but some people just, they don't give it a second thought. They walk right up and they say, hey, Joe, Yeah, that really is an amazingly complete system you have. Um, were there any more questions? I don't see any more out there. Um, I guess Dennis Belcher has one. I just want to say I've, I've uh, demonstrated, uh, I kind of lost track the number of clubs, but what stuck in my mind real fast with Bob and his group is it was very polished. He understood not only what it took for the audience to see, but also with, for the presenter to feel like he was in the room so that you could reach out and engage people on the fly. And, you know, and as soon as as soon as um, uh, we got done with that meeting, I said to Bob, Bob, you got to join this hybrid group. They need you uh, because I think it's what a lot of us aspire to uh, the central uh, Indiana wood folks are already there. So my, thank you, Bob, for sharing all that with us. Amazing presentation. Well Glad done. I Glad I could help. And you're right about the two-way experience there as well. What we often do um, that never really gets captured is before the meeting starts, if the presenter is online, you know, we put him in direct communication with the audience and let that conversation start before the presentation. And it's amazing how, again, that changes what follows because then the presenter is comfortable with who is there in the room. Mm -hmm. um, I, I wanna go back to that question that somebody had asked initially about the SDI. One of the, one of the reasons I shy away from both USB and HDMI signals is a lot of times those uh, video signals are processed right on the motherboard of your computer. And uh, unfortunately, a lot of computers aren't designed to have multiple channels being used at the same time. Some motherboards actually only accommodate two USB channels. You can plug multiple things in using a converter, but the processing power is greatly reduced. And so sometimes uh, anyone who's run like vMix with uh, six or seven USB cameras or things plugged into it, it'll bottleneck and it'll freeze up on you. And again, it's lack of pro proper processing power. Whereas an SDI camera requires its own uh, video card or uh, capture card. And so the raw processing powder, whether you're using a computer or like the ATEM mixer, it's going to happen in those devices rather than uh, take up resources from your motherboard. So um, that's where thinking through that right up front was a key part of what we decided needed to happen before we chose which cameras to go with. So, All right, that's terrific. And uh, I'm sure people are going to appreciate the full diagrams that you're going to make available yep. um, to actually look at the details. John, I think you've already got those uploaded somewhere. No, I haven't uploaded them. I'm going to upload the whole meeting into the AAW okay. uh, chapter leadership library tomorrow and the next day. Harvey Rogers is working with me on processing this video from tonight as well as getting all that stuff in order. So it's easily as easily findable as we can within that system. We're just we're using that because it's available to us. All right, Bob, I really appreciate the presentation and the timeliness.